I'm here uh, in downtown Denver with Professor Wesley Marshall. Uh, Wes is fine. Wes, what, what is it you do at uh, CU Denver? So I'm a professor of civil engineering transportation. Um, I actually have a joint appointment in urban planning, so um, a little bit uh, the kind of engineer that does answers kind of questions on more of that side of the street, the planning side. Mm -hmm. um, but my background is a lot of engineering too, so right. maybe more a little mathematical. Um, than a lot of planners might be. But big picture, I'm looking to help build a world that's more sustainable, that's safer. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff, like if you look at the empirical research that is out there, yeah. it's like biking, it's actual transportation, it's walking, it's transit. A lot of that stuff builds communities that end up being safer. Right. And it's the opposite of sort of what engineering is pushing us towards. Right. Um, so it's a big disconnect, and that's what I'm trying to expose and, yeah. and show. Yeah. So if I swing the camera over here, away from us, and we just kind of look at what we're seeing here, uh, what is this this environment here? What's it called? Uh, so this is Confluence Park. This is a, where the Platte and the Cherry Creek come together mm -hmm. in this one kind of intersection of, of waterways. Mm -hmm. And parallel to both of these routes are bike trails. Mm -hmm. and they connect a lot of the neighbors of Denver to downtown Denver. Um, like even for me, I mean, I can get from my house in the Central Park neighborhood, which mm -hmm. is about seven and a half miles from here, mm -hmm. to here without ever crossing a street. Yeah. Um, it's not seven and a half miles when they go that route, it's more like mm -hmm. 13 or 14, but sure. the fact that I can get here without ever crossing a street is sort of amazing. Um, yeah. And this would even, if I could go south, and this would bring me to a lot of other neighborhoods to Denver. So it's a big connector right. for yeah. anyone walking, biking, scooting, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for uh, meeting up with me here this afternoon and uh, taking us for a little ride uh, around Denver. We can go wherever you want me, wh wh we'll see whatever you the, want me to see. So. Some of the newer facilities. That okay, some of the in. newer facilities. So there's okay. a, a low stress biking network, sort of okay. what the city's trying to push towards now. And, okay. Yeah, you know, I think historically you might have a good segment that has sort of a nice bike facility, right. but the sort of lack of connections. And, okay. Um, a lot of people have seen some of the stuff that's happening in downtowns around the country. So right. in Denver, New York, a lot of yeah. cities like that are doing a lot of things in sort of bigger streets. Yeah. This is more in residential neighborhoods. Okay. Um, where you see how they're they're doing it in a way where they're using almost every tool in the toolkit to do it. So they're okay. using diverters, they're using um, curb extensions, they're using bulb outs, they're using all that sort of stuff right. to make it more of a network feel yeah. where people yeah. can get around. and not have to be the bravest, yeah, most yeah. fearless cyclist yeah, on yeah. the planet to do so. Okay, let's go see it. All right. All right. Yeah, let's pull over and kind of talk a little bit about this. So how would you describe this treatment here? Uh, so this would be a protected bikeway or cycle track. Um, yeah. So instead of the typical bike lane or, or buffer bike lane where you have paint or even like a foot long, wide long strip of paint, the other protection. So not just those sort of plastic ballers, but the sort of rubberized yeah. things in between. So it gives a little bit more protection to the bicyclists. And for a street like this where it's not the widest and you know, cars are coming to the highway up here. So mm -hmm. this is a path to get to the Highlands neighborhoods too. So right. this does a good job of I think, protecting bicyclists yeah. along past the aquarium, some of the other right. things yeah. on the stretch. And what I like about this and, and would love to just kind of point out is that, you know, we're using lighter, quicker, cheaper materials here. None of this is, is hardcore engineering. I mean, we're, we're just talking about flex posts here and some bolt down 
rubberized stops. And so, you know, once the design is pretty much done, I mean, this is, you know, this is not hardcore, heavy construction here. Yeah, it's cheap and quick. Yeah. And it's couldn't it can be iterative too so yes. you see other places in the city where they start with this and now they have you know big concrete planters and mm -hmm. concrete curbs in between yep. so that is something you might see down the line with something like this too yeah and the other thing i like to point out too is that you know sometimes you know cities end up going through these like phases you know maybe they start out by upgrading their typical bike lane and then put a buffer in and from the buffer they say well, okay well that didn't you know that didn't cause the end of the world and and you know stuff the stuff is still happening so yeah. then the next thing you know is they throw in the flex posts and you know oh, okay well that's good but you know flex posts aren't quite enough and then the next step is all right let's throw some uh, <laughs> physical barriers in there too um, and then now cities, some cities are, are actually just going directly to Yeah, well, you know, I think this. there's enough examples yeah. where you can, but yeah. I mean, not yeah. that long ago, yeah. people needed a chance to see it, to feel it, to yes. try it. And yeah. like something like this, you could do without too much time, money, or effort and yeah. give people a chance to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and to your point, yeah, this could be something that goes in and helps establish that high comfort network and then you can always, as a city, come back and put more robust uh, stuff in later on uh, as money, you know, provides yeah. and the need, you know, is there. And, and so, you learn yeah. from your mistakes. And too. you learn from yeah. it, yeah. And see where, you know, especially the intersections, like how this Ah, and see, now I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> see, because this is a great example of, you know, these are the straightaways. These are the, you know, these are, this is the easy stuff. What really gets challenging is the intersections, and of course the intersections is probably where we need the most robust sort of treatments, but uh, it's very rare that yeah, uh, a city will go to quite that. Quite as so. good at those yeah. yet. Um, yeah. They're making some strides, but yeah. doing much better along the segment so far. Yeah. Like this is one where there's probably not as many problems, like when you have the parking protected yeah. bike lane. Um, you know, as a bicyclist, you're sort of hidden behind these giant SUVs, mm -hmm. And when you get to the intersection, the car that's driving along yeah. the stretch had no idea you were there. Right. Well, and that, that just hit. comes to the fact that they didn't do a good job of having yeah. the clear zones at approaching the intersection so that, yeah, you know, there's plenty you of visibility. Yeah, you want to sort of set the parking back. Yes, exactly. There's a lot of stuff you can do, but yeah, um, yeah. that's sort of where there's still problems. Yeah, yeah. No, well, daylighting, that, daylighting uh, the, yeah. that area there. Okay, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's go uh, check out... Uh, how they uh, tried to do some intersections. Oh, right. yeah, they probably didn't. <laughs> oh, we'll see some. So, this is one of the places where you see they're doing some stuff at the intersection. Yeah. With the curb extension, cars going slow around there. Yeah. They're daylighting it. Yeah. Things like that. Um, putting these turn spaces for bikes to kind of sit in and yep. wait in a safe place. Yep. Um, there's better examples, but this is you know, sort of an early one to show like sure. the idea, the thinking. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good example of, again, you don't have to overthink it folks i mean lighter quicker cheaper materials you're just gonna kind of figure out your angles and what you want what you really want those turn radii to be and make sure that you've got enough space and what you're really also doing is you're creating a safer environment yeah. for pest pedestrians too we well, can see they have the flashing beacons here yep. too i mean mm -hmm. it's not a hawk or a signal but it's it's a little bit something where they have these before were totally unsignalized uncontrolled crosswalks yeah yeah. Which we know there's maybe a 50-50 chance of a driver stopping for you if you're crossing one of those. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit better, still yeah. relative, not great, but yeah. heading in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good stuff. All right. All right. And you can see some more treatments here. 
trying to deal with the alley. This is one of the uh, quick build roundabouts. Yeah. They put it in with just asphalt and the, the rubberized curb cuts and these go in in a couple hours. Right. My way back and forth to work, there's one spot where it wasn't there in the morning, I came home, there's three of them. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh. So for those who may not be real familiar with why we would want to have a facility like this, what can you say about it? Well, one, it slows cars down. Yeah. So. It doesn't give the way they design these, where there's the, you know horizontal deflection, so a car yeah. can't just go straight through. Right. Um, you see places that do a little bit better, at, like in Berkeley, they'll have something like this, and they'll have stop signs for the cars mm -hmm. at the intersections. But this is more of a traditional mini roundabout. Yeah. Um, still slows cars down and does a nice job of that. Yeah. I almost find the the addition of stop signs to a, a, a traffic circle um, defeating the purpose. Because right, what you really are. what you really want to do is is get them to to slow down and think and yeah. look. Yeah. And the problem I always have with stop lights and stop signs is that, you know, they drivers will will tend to be like, okay, it's my priority. I'm going now and not look. <laughs> you know? Zero attention until it's yeah, your turn. Exactly. Start going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is the whole the the yeah. whole point of having shared space and naked streets is to try to get everybody to slow down and think yeah. and, and make eye contact. Does do that to some extent. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing I'll mention is another good thing about the low stress neighborhood bikeways they're doing is they're connecting actual destinations. So Sloan's Lake is right, right here. Right. A lot of places will put them in sort of intermittently. So you have like a scatter shot of nice bike facilities. Yeah. Actually connecting it with places where people want to go. Right. Kind of makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll swing around and, and, and just get a, a little bit of, of what the design looks like here. And yeah, I mean, you can nitpick and kind of criticize and say, well, maybe there's not enough, uh, you know, hor horizontal deflection or whatever. But, you know, at the fact, to your point, is that it went up as fast as it did. And you can start collecting some data and you get some ideas to whether it's slowing people down and, you know, creating that um, awareness, too, of, oh, that's right, you know. There's people here. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, we see the, our, our beloved Sharrows in the middle of, of the, the street because this, again, is one of the neighborhood bikeways. And that's one of the things. That, yeah, so we had know, it protected. It went to a regular bike lane and yeah. it goes through Sharrow on this last block because mm -hmm. um, the street narrows as we get closer to right. Sloan's Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And really, you know, not, not, to, not to pick on Sharrows at all, but... Um, we know that when they're used inappropriately, putting a Shero on a street that has yeah. a design speed that's too high for it, uh, it doesn't it doesn't help us. <laughs> you should pick on Shero. Uh, we do have a research paper where we showed they're worse than nothing. Like well, as, no, as North Americans are doing. It. Yeah. However, if you actually put some sort of emblem down on the street, whether it's a Shero or whether it's a feet strut, yeah. or you know, emblem down on the street. Um, it, context matters a lot because if you actually have you know a situation like in the Netherlands where yeah. it's a shared street environment, which is what we're we're saying this yeah. is when we you know create this neighborhood bikeway and we yeah. put a, a Shero down, it's an indication that this is a s shared street. Well, I'd even say so. that we wouldn't need these protective facilities if we built the streets the right, right way in the first place. What do you mean by that? If we built streets that were slow and mm -hmm. and safe and kind of force self-enforced drivers to drive at a slow pace and sure. force them to sort of pay attention, we wouldn't need the, the heavy protection bike lanes. Right. Um, the and, fact and, now, and now you're starting to talk <laughs> about a design speed that's closer to that magical 30 kilometers right. per hour, right. which is that the shared street environment, the feet strut environment yeah. that we see in the Netherlands and, and other countries. I still think a lot of places so. you'd want the protective bikeways because it really helps kids or, or people sure. like people that aren't might as comfortable or confident to, to ride. But at the same time, 
I mean, we need them because we've done just a crappy job designing the streets around them. Well, and I think that that goes down to your design speed of your road too, because yeah. if it's if it's anything north of really 20 to 25 miles per hour in terms of speed that you're seeing with motor vehicles, then yeah, yeah you probably do need that protection uh, for uh, for for the cyclists, you know, for the people at that time. And you'll notice that how how they go through very very slowly. Of course, we're helping. We're traffic calming. Yeah. My shirt the fact that we too, can stay so. here in the middle of the street, we don't yeah. feel like it's a problem. Um, well, that brings up the second point. That the, the real magic to this is two things. It's volume and speed. Yeah. Yeah. We have to bring those motor vehicle uh, volumes down to acceptable levels because if it is a, a rat run, if it is a cut through, then really then you also need to do a diverter. Yeah. And we'll see some diverters a little bit later too. Okay, let's go find them. All right. Cool. So we're gonna end up going down the street. I'll we'll go by Sloan Lake and... Yeah. Yeah, get some B-roll of that. I actually shot some really good B-roll of a really nicely done quiet street in uh, in Boulder this morning. Oh, yeah? And uh, <laughs> it'll be a perfect overlay to what you were saying about get the design right. And you don't need to do all this other stuff. <laughs> well, what's that street? It's one block north of Pearl Street. Um, oh, one block. All those mini traffic circles. Every other oh, block. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Pine Street and and uh, Spruce both have a lot of uh, uh, yeah. mini they're, traffic circles. They're not, they're tiny, yeah. but they work. Like, yeah. the street is great to bike on. Yeah, yeah. So here you see so. Like, the, the, the bike ways bring you to a location. Like yeah. This is, I think, where we're missing a lot of uh, years of this. So in, in the research and the work that you are doing, describe that a little bit. Are you uh, kind of looking at what cities are doing and then evaluating or, or what is that? What is it? How does yeah, it really get structured? I mean, fortunately, being in a city like Denver, it's like a living laboratory. We can get out right. there and really see what's happening and test it, like see what the implications are. Right. Um, I think historically, Traffic engineering is done almost based in theory. Right. The empiricism didn't matter. <laughs> we thought wider roads would be safer. Right. So we did that for generations. Right. And as it turns out. <laughs> so, yeah, so you mentioned you've got sort of a living laboratory. Do you bring your students out as well? Yeah. Yeah. We do. Excellent. Um, it's one of the benefits of coming to school like this. Like, you know, a lot of researchers are trying to do this stuff and they're in places where it's not happening, it's tough. Right. And again, we'll spin around and see another one of these quick build traffic circles. I think we want to go up Perry there. Beautiful. We'll... You see here, they've also added speed pumps. So even yeah. though it's a share facility, so it's yep. basically a center running share row. Yep. You got the traffic circles, you got the speed pumps. The combination helps to, mm -hmm. like you said, limit volumes, limit speeds. Yeah. So one of the, the problems that I have when we look at a street that kind of looks like this is, is that straight shot? <laughs> is that lack of, of horizontal deflection other than that one traffic circle? And then, yeah, then you end up putting a whole bunch of, uh, of speed humps to try to slow down those speeds. Um, it is kind of narrow, which is nice, you know, when you see the parked cars on either side, you do see that you have a nice pinch point there um, to help, you know, mitigate the speeds. But yeah, I mean, these straight shots are rough because it really, it, it speaks speed to a driver. A lot of cities have been, for whatever reason, really hesitant to do this kind of traffic on anything sort of vertical like this, the vertical deflection, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I find vertical deflection to be actually far less effective than uh, horizontal and right. chicanes. but you know? it's also far cheaper. Right? So oh, cool. Of course. <laughs> of course. Here you can see a corner already. Did the yeah, we've got a corner that's been done. This is nice. And again, the effects of this are to slow those turning vehicles down. And so what we have here, Wes, 
is a great example of what you were just talking about which is a little bit of that horizontal deflection yeah it's point. not quite helping us with the sight line but it is squeezing it in significantly more than just the door you know or the sides of the parked cars right. so this gives us a um a single motor vehicle puka as we say in, in Hawaiian, a hole. <laughs> and so, yeah, it forces, yeah. I mean, it's a two way yield street for yep. a second here. It's a pinch point, it brings it all in, and cars, if they meet here, they have to almost stop and take turns. Yeah. Yeah, a two way yield street. I mean, uh, it, and what I love about these is that even in North America, um, drivers intuitively know what to do with these streets because we, we run into them, <laughs> yeah. we, we force it to them. And, you know, there, there are plenty of, uh, you know, places where they see them. So yeah, yeah, that's pretty fun. Hey, what's up? You guys are looking at these street things? Oh yeah, just kind of checking them out. This thing is <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting uh, point. He actually brought up a really good point there. Um, it's worthless and it's ugly. Well, it probably is proving its weight in terms of its worthfulness. Um, but do many people do find flex posts ugly? And that's, that's an interesting challenge, which is one of the reasons why I think that being able to create in our, you know, more tools in our toolbox that can maybe pull in some more attractive, more robust, materials yeah. can really help cities out i will say we haven't tested that one in particular but we tested mm -hmm. similar ones and vehicle speeds do go significantly down yeah yeah and you know some of the more robust attractive materials i'm thinking of uh, you might be able to think of some more but are you know putting some planters in there yeah <laughs> and have some beautiful stuff in and here we've got another of our traffic calming traffic circle. Hey Wes, pull off over here. So we'll turn the camera around and catch that, what we were kind of talking about. I gotta see what I climbed up so I know why I'm so out of out of breath okay so uh, again this is a nice little example to be able to show just I exactly what we were talking about earlier is that where we don't have anything in the middle then it really does look like a straight shot yeah and that's where you know it's not drivers fault that their their speeds get out of control a car coming down yeah. the hill like this and yeah. there's nothing here and there's no stop signs yeah anything yeah um it's hard not to get going pretty fast though. yeah exactly i mean it's it's hard not to get going pretty fast and and i think that you know ultimately you know yes we can put the speed humps in but that's still kind of punishing them for the design that didn't wasn't done right if you wanted to slow people down truly yeah if, <laughs> if you do it right you don't need those sort of interventions yes. after the fact but, yeah um yeah i mean 99 percent of what we built isn't yeah <laughs> so, yeah 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 uh we are coming yeah. in after the fact and trying to retrofit yeah and I, I think it's hard to rely on on just sort of things like this because a lot of times, I mean, maybe not this street's not the best example of it because it is pretty narrow anyways. Mm -hmm. But when you have wider streets in between, cars still get going. Yeah. 40, 45 in between the yes. intersections. Well, and even racing between the, the speed humps. Yeah. <laughs> if, the, if the blocks are long enough. <laughs> I mean, that's where you end yeah. up with our arterial system. I mean, yeah. they're designed for speeds of 65 or whatever, and you end yeah. up going 50, 55 in between red lights, and you wait two minutes. Yeah. So average speed over a corridor is like eight miles an hour. Yeah. Like if we had designed it with something like this, you'd get more cars probably in terms of throughput and also yeah. a lot slower speeds, a lot safer. Yeah. I mean, when I look at this too, I, I look at it and say, okay, we've, we've got a nice little uh, um, uh, traffic uh, speed mitigation measure here in a traffic circle. You know, maybe that next, you know, big intersection is 
you know, filter permeability and, and kind of divert the cars off of the street. You know, why should somebody be going multiple, multiple blocks if there's an alternative uh, arterial or collector uh, to get them off of what is essentially a shared space? It's something we're calling in all ages yeah. and abilities, meaning kids are going to be on this. Yep, and we are foreshadowing one of the things we'll see shortly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's go see that. All right. All right. So this is a school. So this is a 20 mile per hour limit during school hours. So here you see they do a lot of the intersections. Yeah. All the intersections have curb extension. Yeah. Slow the turning cars. Yeah. And more perfectly doing the crosswalk. And again, baffling to me, the amount of car parking around the schools. I mean, that's, that's a real interesting challenge. I mean, <laughs> parents are still going out of their way to drive their kids to it's these neighborhood schools. Uh, like my kid's elementary school, there was a, a kid that got hit in the crosswalk. Like yeah. He was okay, but yeah. after that, I'm gonna consider here for a second. Yeah. After that, the school convened like a safety committee. Yeah. I kind of showed up to give my two cents and hear what they were talking about. Yeah. And their idea of safety was to make it easier for people to drive. Right. To make like a driveway that brings you right to the door so kids can get right on out. Right. I was like, we need to do the opposite. Yeah. Like make it harder to drive. Make it easier to do everything but drive. Yeah. That's where we'll see the safety. Yeah. You sound like an anarchist. <laughs> How did that go over? Uh, well, they didn't build the, the driveway they were thinking of. And yeah. like they did start thinking of ways to do things like this and make it, you know, when you're taking a corner intersection like this, you can't do it. Yeah. You know, this curb cut, you could probably take this corner where the original curb is, 30 miles an hour without really yeah. bothering you. Yeah. Forcing you out to there. Yeah. Lucky to do it at 10 or 15. Yeah. Um, if you're trying. Yeah. And, and for folks that, you know, you're looking at this and you may not really be understanding what we're talking about here, is because of this bulb out of, of the flex posts, we're able to create a really, really sharp angle here at the corner. And as Wes was just saying, is that the old curb, yeah, you could whip right around that. Good 25, 30 miles an hour easily. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you were driving through here. Yeah. You cut that without even slowing down. And now what happens, we'll, we'll pretend we're a car. Now what happens is you have to come all the way up to this point here. And really they needed another post right there. But anyways, um, so I guarantee they cut that. But then it also puts them at more of a perpendicular angle to the kids, adults, everybody else in the crosswalk too. I so. think this is an example of the iterative. Yeah. I believe the first one came further out and they pushed it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been for the buses, mm -hmm. maybe what I heard. Yeah. Um, I think they were having trouble taking this particular corner. Yeah. It's hard to tell, but this is also hilly. This is right. kind of... <coughs> drop off the curb here. I, I don't know, Professor. You, you, you said something there that makes me uh, very curious, too. You said the buses were having a hard time making the corner. What, what? You mean we have buses so big that they can't be nimble in small little neighborhoods where well, usually the argument serving? comes from the fire marshal. But <laughs> these fire trucks, and if you look at the fire trucks in our country versus other countries, they're twice the size. Yeah. Like, and yeah. they, they can't take these corners. At the same time, it's a uh, it's interesting because the way we design streets is causing the emergencies that the fire trucks having to go to. Right. But we're designing them in order to, to allow the fire trucks to get there. And yeah. I when I think of that, I argue there's a lot of places in Denver, Boston, a lot of old cities yeah. that were built before traffic engineering standards. Like right. they're way narrower than yeah. we'd allow now. Yeah. Guess what? If there's a fire in that street, the fire truck will get there. Yeah. They do every they time. Do. Every time. Um. So <laughs> there are ways around that. And we're seeing smaller equipment. I mean, it, it's it's not like you can't get it. You can get it. And we're picking on the buses and we're picking on the, the, the fire trucks a little bit. But really, what we want to do is, is point out that we should be designing our neighborhoods and designing our streets for the quality of life that you want, not designing them around the size of vehicles. Right. 
whether they're commercial vehicles, uh, rescue vehicles, or personal vehicles. And our personal vehicles are also getting out of control in terms of size. That's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Um, and the way safety works is mass times acceleration. Like, so the bigger the mass, yep. the more danger and more kinetic energy, like yeah. the more force. Like it's, yeah. that's where yeah. Yeah, and if we swing around here like this, and go ahead and, and head to the this side over here, uh, Professor, and we'll we look at this. You know, thinking it, with that with that storyline or or through pre, uh, thread of even personal vehicles are getting huge. I wanted you to be there because what we're now seeing is that some of them are so big and the sight lines are so poor that they can't even see a child or a whole string of children yeah. in front of them. Yeah. And so we're getting to a point now where, you know, they could be scanning to the left to see if it's it's safe to move and turn to the right and then turn. By the time they look, there could be, you know, three or four children well, right in front of them. If they stop at that stop bar, yeah. there could be a kid in the middle of this crosswalk. Yep. And they want to be able to see it from there. Yeah. Because yeah, I, mean, I think everyone's probably seen that video. I think it was from an Indianapolis news station where they sat yeah. 20 kids or something yeah. in front of a SUV. Yeah. And that was five or six years ago. So the SUV was even that big then. Yeah. And they couldn't see it. So yeah. that would be, you know, a kid sitting here yeah. in the crosswalk. So this is an elementary school. So if you have a yeah. kindergartner, yeah. they're about yay high anyways. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't be able to see. So if this person's scanning around, that'd yeah. be tough. Yeah. Like the fact that we were standing here like in what used to be almost the middle of the intersection, but we're sort of out of the intersection. Right. I mean, that, I mean there's so much yeah. usable space that we were just wasting before, too. And when would you say that this was probably, the street was probably built with these dimensions? I mean, I get the sense that it's probably in the 40s or 50s. Yeah, I was thinking so, 30s, but I... Yeah, I maybe 30s, yeah. 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 Um, like this certainly, is, it was, certainly was platted in the 30s. Maybe they didn't build very many uh, paved streets in the 30s with the Depression, but uh, it, unless it was putting people to work. But the point is, is that it's not like this is some <laughs> super, super modern dimensions of speed demons that, you know, from the 70s or 80s. I mean, this, yeah. this is a legacy stuff of when we really got addicted to um, car-centric design. Yeah, and this is, I mean, honestly, probably before a lot of the traffic engineering guidelines even came into the forefront so this was sort of built in the you know, kind of heyday when the cars were at the forefront right well i mean and well, I de facto that's what ended up getting codified were yeah, <laughs> those yeah, dimensions yeah, that's where we ended up anyways <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um let's go this way school street program um that's happening in in all across france and in the uk and just not allowing driving to the school, <laughs> you know. Well, NACTO also has their Streets for Kids manual. Have you seen that one? I haven't gone through it yet. Um, yeah. I mean, to me, that's really should be essentially what our design criteria should be. If it's not safe for kids to yeah. walk or bike on, yeah. we're doing something wrong. Yeah. Especially if we're talking about near a school. Right. And I guess this brings up, you know, we're, we're rolling down this street. This street feels pretty darn comfortable to us. Just, you know, rolling through here. It's a little bit traffic calm. The volumes are low. Um, but we're rolling right over these dread, dread, dreaded uh, sharrows. Should we vilify these for being in existence or should we just take yeah, them off? This street was already a shared space in that way before those sharrows were in place. Now right. it's just sort of signed for that way. Right. They've done a good job of traffic calming in between is sort of the idea. Yeah. So when the, instead of just putting up a sign that says neighborhood bikeway, right. they design for that. They design right. so these sharrows mean something. That right. They, so they, the share, the share. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that right then. So we see the sharrows. We see the sharrows. We also we see, also see the, exactly. We so we we don't have that unbroken sight line yeah. of, that says, okay, West, speed, speed, speed. You just throw these arrows up and then it's going to fix everything. Right. I it's mean, not going to do it. It has to be one of just, just the whole. Like yeah. It doesn't do anything. Exactly. And again, there's the signage for the neighborhood bikeway. And again, these are, you know, the, 
I don't know what the width of this street actually is, maybe right around 40, maybe a little less than that. Yeah, um, but it's, it, it's, yeah, it must be less than that because boy, when there's parked vehicles on both sides, it's a narrow space, it's a yield street. And uh, that's so cool. We're coming up on a di diverter here. Yeah, okay. The car is coming to just half the right. Yeah. No choice. Um, bicycles, pedestrians. I guess you can see one car did not make that turn. Mm hmm. Yeah. This one that you saw. Yeah. Love, but he knows we can't do this. Correct. Yeah. So, what we're really talking about here is we know that this is sort of a, a best in class sort of approach to uh, the for, uh, filtered permeability here. We're able to get cars off of this street, which is a neighborhood bikeway, um, and still people walking and biking can go through here. Um, I am noticing it's that the motor vehicle speeds are pretty pretty grand. I mean, when I look at 30 miles per hour here, I mean, we're talking 50 kilometers per hour. That's that's really inappropriate. I, <laughs> to I, should, be, I usually, uh, in my main backpack, I yeah. have a radar gun I carry around with me all the time, but I yeah. brought the lighter one for this. I forgot yeah. to bring that. But, yeah. I mean, that's faster than 30 miles an hour. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so there's other design issues on these streets, but... Like they're trying to make the network design doing a better job than that is a right. huge part of it this yeah. is a good start um but the elephant in the room are still these and we'll see a, a worse when we get to federal that's probably the most dangerous street in denver well and federal is almost not even uh, a fair fight because it's it's technically a state road yeah it's a state highway you know and it and and, and that's going to be a whole nother thing but when you talk about a street <clears throat> that right over there i see a driveway you know i yep. see garages and so that you, car is the back. yeah, that's what I'm saying is the car is literally that car will have to back up into a downhill, fast moving street of, you know, 50 kilometers per hour or more. And ouch. Well, I mean, if you can imagine sort of extending the medium instead of having the two way turn lanes in the sure. middle, yeah. um, cause when you have that, the street is so wide open. So, I mean, just open to your eyes, eye lines. Yeah that it's hard not to drive fast. It's designed for that. Yeah, well, let's let's actually take a look down it and yeah. we'll, we'll actually see too that probably the elephant in the room too is that this street should not be just a painted bike lane. This should be a protected bike lane. You know what I mean? Is that even a bike lane? I guess. <laughs> it is. Yeah. But it's the kind of bike lane like if anyone's using this and you're not on one of the parallel routes, you're crazy. Yeah, like yeah. To put a bike in it, yeah. it's one of my problems when the whole complete street movement came to prominence in the beginning. Yeah. That's what people were thinking is we need to shove bike lanes on the streets mm -hmm. that we should not have bike lanes. Well, I would say I would say definitively though, this needs to be a street that is slowed down. We need to do that first. Right. Tossing the bike lane here, you're asking for trouble. Yeah, no, no, no. But don't get me wrong. I'm literally yeah. saying that what needs to happen to slow this street down is we need to take some real estate away from the motor vehicles, yes. create a protected bikeway through here. And the reason you do that is because traveling 50 kilometers per hour on this street while you've got driveways where people are backing up and, and you have crossings like this where you're prioritizing p pedestrians to try to get across the street um and people are not yielding people are flying down through here they did not yield for us they did not yeah supposed to yield for us exactly but it's not their fault why is it not their fault is because the design is screaming go fast and you're not going to be able to slam on your brakes in right. the last minute by the know, time they get here second. it's sort of too late for them they think oh exactly like, yeah i can't stop at this point so i mean so so that is one of the biggest challenges is is like okay if we're doing diverters we're we're diverting the motor vehicles from this street to this street but this street also should not be this fast yes so which, what speed should this uh, this street be when we put in that protected bikeway? Well, if you add the protected bikeway, you add the median, you 
narrow it down and you get to 30 miles an hour, you get to 25 miles an hour, like this 30 is the speed limit, but it's not real. Like that is right. not the way it's designed. That design right there is easily 45. You right. feel comfortable driving 40, 45 miles per hour. And you feel uncomfortable going yeah. 25, 30, the yeah. way it's designed. So right. the diverter was necessary. It yeah. was impossible. If this is going to be a bikeway, we couldn't yeah. really get across without something yeah. like this. So like we talked about the iterative nature of all this, right. one of the next steps should be doing something with this too. Yeah, yeah. What about just saying, okay, blanket speed limit reduction? The entire city <clears throat> is going to be... Well, Denver's done that. 20 miles per hour, and therefore this street is now 20 miles per hour regardless of the design. What, what if we just did that? So, two things. One, big picture, we know that drivers drive with the road of design like, right. uh, for the most part. Um, so unless you have big enforcement and cities can't really do that unless you have crazy camera enforcement like you have in some countries other countries in the US we don't really have that so we need to design the street for the speeds we want we can't just expect to throw up a sign and expect people to do it so here we see a sign is 30 cars aren't going 30 at the same time you see the places that have done the mass reductions mm -hmm. and their safety has increased so empirically it's doing something um, yeah. I think it's not enough but it's, it's the first step I like to say it's this and yeah we need to do them both we need to do it all yeah um i'm sure there's some people shouting at the screen right now saying but what about enforcement it's a cop-out for engineers right. like when engineers design a crappy road like this and we look at the speeds i mean there's two things we do one we would measure the speeds and we'd probably tell you we looked at the 85th percentile we should raise the speed limit right the second thing we would tell you is like, oh, it's not our problem. It yeah. needs to be enforced. Yeah. Or people need to be educated. Well, let's let's put it's the 85th percentile to bed because really, you know, everybody's trying to step away, including the manuals are trying to step away from the 85th percentile because they're basically saying you're not using your engineering judgment. And by doing, by utilizing the 85th percentile, you're, you're not really, you know, getting to the spirit of what you should be doing, which is setting your speed limits for the environment that you want within your communities. So, yeah, I, I mean, the, in fact, I think the, the updated language is, is that it, it's a tool, but it shouldn't be the only tool. And you um, shouldn't use that as what you <clears throat> are True, are I think the problem it. for a lot of states will be it's codified. Um, yes. That we have to sort of fix that aspect of it as well. And what you mean by that is in the state themselves, they have identified that and they've codified that even though the manuals and the feds are basically saying, no, it doesn't actually say that. Hey, California <laughs> just fixed this problem, but previously yeah. they weren't even allowed to enforce right. speed on streets that they haven't had a speed study to make sure the speed limit is in right. coordination with the 85th percentile. Right. So they'd have these problems, this is a vicious cycle where you yeah. can enforce it. People know you can't enforce it to drive faster. If you want to actually enforce you need to go out and do a speed study yeah you do the speed study and everyone's driving so fast you need to raise the speed yeah. limit yeah and then you can enforce it yeah. like and, so and they it's would, just it's all insanity it's, it's all insanity, insanity. Yeah. And, and really what we're saying here is that we should be looking at the context of this neighborhood and what it is we're asking these streets to do and saying that you know this should be a street it's a neighborhood street there's driveways here there's kids walking across the street i mean Motor vehicles should be traveling at non-lethal speeds, which means we need to be slowing the speeds down dramatically. And leaning into, as your, your point, is you know, what are other tools in our toolbox to really be able to bring the, the, the speeds down from a design perspective? Certainly, you know, redesigning that and putting yep. some protected bikeways on here. Um, you know, that could be one of the things, but there's probably many other things that could help. Quite honestly, this this, this right here, it, yeah. this is part of it. I mean, this really cr creates a, a traffic calming barrier there. Although, quite frankly, most of these vehicles are, you know, the drivers are whipping well, it's through It's just a short stretch. You yeah. need it to extend. And more than one. More yeah, than I one. mean, it's like, yeah. yeah, if this is like one after the other after the other. Well, we saw with the neighborhood bikeway, like yeah. intermittently you have yeah. the traffic circles, you have the yeah. speed humps, you have the diverters, you have the bulb outs, yeah. you have the pinch points. Um, you sort of have to think the same thing. It's, it's a different type of street, so you're going to have a different toolbox. Yeah. But you need the sort of same thinking where you have these yeah. different types of tools to do what we're talking about. 
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.